Hi everyone, I'm Kathy Aoki, the Chief Curator of the Museum of Historical Makeovers, and I am excited to talk to you today for one of our PSA convos. I am going to give you a whirlwind tour of monuments, which is of course hot on everybody's mind right now. Um, but first, before I start, I'd like to thank the ICA for having me here today. Um, the ICA is one of the institutions that supports the Museum of Historical Makeovers. Now, some of you people may know our museum um, from the exhibitions we've had throughout the Bay Area and across the country. It's because our permanent facilities are always in a, what seems like a constant state of retrofit. And so we rely on institutions to show the works in our permanent collection. So I will show you a few examples right now. Um, right, so if you'd like to look us up, it's again the Museum of Historical Makeovers. My name is Kathy Aoki and I'm the Chief Curator. One of the shows you may know about is these, um, the Grant, Gwen Stefani Grand Burial Exhibition. Um, this exhibition took place at Swarm Gallery in 2009, so that was a really good one. Um, and I had a hand in even some of the archaeological discoveries for that exhibition. Um, coming up soon will be Ancient Tanning Beds, The Darker Side of Brown. And another show you may be familiar with is um, our show on bleaching and epilation, which is called uh, Once Plucked, Twice Shaved. So um, that's some of the things in our repertoire. And of course, the Hello Kitty Monument shows. So I'll be talking about all of that in a moment. Now this talk today is about monuments. And you may know a lot of monuments, like here's Hello Kitty Monument. Um, here's Mount Rushmore, um, you know, on Easter Island. And what we know about monuments is they always generate a lot of controversy. You know, I see a lot of comments are going by, and I just want to let you know, I will be answering questions at the end of the lecture, which will be in about 25 minutes. And so if you could please hold your questions and then put them in the comments, and I will be sure to answer them um, as efficiently as possible. So um, let me start off by talking about the Sphinx. Now... You may think you know about the Sphinx here. Um, let me turn off. The, um, this is a photo by uh, Felix Bonfils, um, and it is when the Sphinx was still buried underground in sand. Um, this Sphinx might be considered controversial because it's supposed to be a male figure rather than the Greek female figure of the Sphinx. But have you ever heard of the tiara of Sphinx? Let me show you a picture of her. Now this is a sphinx and it's a little mini one and this was used by male architects at the time to um, kind of make the decisions about the design before um, it was implemented on the large sphinx. So this is like basically a working maquette of male architects and of course at the time all architects were male. Um, the remains of the tiara sphinx um, were located here um, I'm sorry, this is backwards, but um, this is on the top of a hill in what was known as Los Angeles before global warming covered that area over with water. So you can see here, here's the remnants of the Tiara Sphinx. And I'd just like to talk a little bit about some of how monuments change over time. So I have a chart here. And this is the Tiara Sphinx throughout the uh, millennia. And um, as you can see, at different periods in time, the body shape changed. So sometimes they would add rock to the front chest formation, and then sometimes they would decrease it. But again, these are all male architects responding to the trends of their time. Um, I also want to point out, uh, I'm going to hold this a little close up so you can see, you know, how the changes were made over time. Um, and it's not impossible to add rock and take rock away from monuments, just as it is suggested that on the ancient Egyptian Sphinx here, um, that it once had a beard that was added on. Here you could add rocks onto the front chest area. Now I also want to tr point out this feature here. Um, this shoulder area of the Tiara Sphinx looks smooth, um, but um, in this photo, um, but later on, these cap sleeves were added to the Sphinx, and it really remains a mystery for um, archaeologists today, as because everyone knows um, no one looks good in cap sleeves. So why they added that is a complete mystery. Okay, moving on um, to more controversial monuments. Let me move these out of the way here. So um, some of you may be familiar with... Um, King Leopold in Belgium. 
So there's been um, controversy there. King Leopold was responsible for a lot of the destructive things um, that happened in the Congo and the enslavement of those people for the rubber trade, and he took that wealth um, you know, to, as a, on a personal basis, then later, you know, kind of shared it with the state. But there's a lot of controversy about him, and his statues have been, um, you know, uh, defaced and torn down. This is a statue, I believe, in Austin that was just taken down this summer. Now, the question is, what do you do with these monuments um, once they've been taken down? And so, some of the most creative solutions come from artists. Um, when you ask historians what to do with these monuments, they might say, uh, to take down the monument, let me switch this here, take down the monument and we'll like put it in a museum. Um, of course that costs resources for museums to do that um, and then there need to be like contextual information. Other monuments have just been taken down in the dead of night and then like no one knows where they are. Um, but if we you know look to artist suggestions for what should be done with monuments, you can see here this is a, an artist working in Belgium, an American artist, and um, what she's done here is pretty much um, tried to hide monuments in the bushes. So it's a way of kind of sliding, you know, sweeping under the rug so that um, the monument can't be seen anymore. It's just like barely there. Here's another example. Um, this is the same artist in Belgium um, where King Leopold is, you know, hiding in the bushes. So these are like some of the suggestions that come from it. I do want to tell you a little bit about Confederate monuments. And I have a chart here. Um, this uh, graph is courtesy of the Southern Poverty, Poverty Law Center. And as you can see, um, this is the end of the Confederate War. And um, there weren't a lot of Confederate monuments raised at that time because of the destructive force. Um, the resources were very much depleted and the South was in a weakened state at that point. But then as the South gained agency and white racists began to join in force, then more and more Confederate statues were developed around the year 1907, 1910. Um, this is where Jim Crow laws are happening. So you can see a massive spike. So it has nothing to do with the timing of the Civil War. It's more about people rewriting the story to suit their needs. And then again in the 60s with the Civil Rights Movement, more Confederate monuments were raised. Now, um, a lot of these Confederate monuments have been vandalized by people today. So he, this is an example um, of an image that was um, of a Jefferson Davis statue. Jefferson was the president of the Confederacy briefly. Um, this also is another picture. Um, this one is a monument that is uh, was in Richmond, Virginia until earlier this year when it was torn down. This is when it was um, at the moment defaced. So again, what to do with these monuments once they're taken down? And we look to an artist suggestion here. Do, do, do. Um, so this is an example of what you might want to do with this Jefferson Davis sculpture. Um, in this case, the artist has ripped the monument down and shoved it in the ground in kind of a, a, a dishonorable burial. Um, and then you can see that there's pigeons roosting on it. Um, I happen to know from this depiction that um, what is towering over this weakened, vulnerable figure now is the Emancipation Oak, um, which is also located in Virginia. So this artist decided to um, bring about kind of a, a ignominious demise of the statue. And what I do like about this work is that it seems like the pigeons are the ones that often vote on patriarchal monuments. So as you know, a lot of monuments are dedicated to white males, um, but then those same statues also attract a lot of pigeons. And so often uh, pigeons might vote on a monument, um, you know, using their own methods. Okay, so um, moving back to this chart here, I showed you this chart earlier with the Confederate monuments dedicated, but did you know about this? This is a trend of patriarchal monuments, and I just mentioned earlier that patriarchal monuments are monuments, um, uh, the most monuments are patriarchal, of uh, like white males. But did you know that there were some monuments that were specifically to push forward the idea that men are always in charge and that power would be passed on and skip the women completely. So if we look at this trend of patriarchal monuments, you can see here, and this um, chart is um, courtesy of the Museum of Historical Makeovers. Um, in around the time that the 19th Amendment was passed, there was a spike in patriarchal monuments as men tried to, again, grasp for power um, as women took charge. 
And then again, here is the Me Too movement progresses up to 2020. Um, again, a lot more patriarchal monuments were built during this time and they were very popular. Now, because a woman ended up in the White House around this time, and women continued to be in the White House from here on out, you can see that it became nearly impossible for, to have patriarchal monuments erected. So um, they were even unable to continue the narrative here. So I do have some examples of what are disgraced monuments to show you. So a lot of these monuments went up, um, they were part of men's clubs on the street, um, you know, in public places, but also in people's private gardens and such. So let me pull out a real artifact. I'm very excited to show you this today now. I've been locked out of the Museum of Historical Makeovers because of the pandemic, so um, I don't have my white gloves, but, um, oh, I just happen to have some, another pair of gloves here for some reason. So let me put on these gloves so I can handle the artifact. Now again, um, you might have questions, and if you do have questions, I invite you to hold them until the comment section um, when I take a break specifically for questions and answers. So, I move this aside, and we're done with these. Now I have my... Okay. So, um, on this platform, I'd like to show you this. Now, um, this is exciting that we have this here at the museum. Now, I'm going to hold it close to the camera. This is a piece of marble that's been carved, and it has a very um, sexist message on it here. And I can show you, I know it's hard to see, um, especially also this is backwards, but let me show you the photo. Okay, so this is the photo of the piece that I'm holding here. It's a piece of marble, and it's part of this piece here. And so you can see that there's Latin words spelling out in there, and the words that we believe this says are patriarchus sine fine, which is bad Latin for unending patriarchy. And so this plaque would have been inset into the building where a men's club might exist, um, uh, just as a reminder that, you know, we're happy to have men in charge. Whoops. It says the sound is off. Um, okay, I don't know how to turn the sound on. Okay, am I still live? Can you hear me now? Okay, great. So, um, so that's one f example of a patriarchal monument that we have um, in our collection. Now, let's see, I have another piece here, and this is kind of exciting. This would be for a private collection. And I'm going to get this piece here. Now, this is um, not a monumental size, but this is actually... Um, something that individuals could order when patriarchy ended. So, um, I don't know if, can you see this? I'm gonna make this bigger here, so I'm bigger. Maybe, um, I think I run into trouble when I turn the picture off. So let's try again. Um, here, we'll put this picture in instead. This is a tomb um, devoted to patriarchy. So you can see it says patriarchy there backwards. Um, it looks like fine Italian marble, but this is part of a diorama. So that if you were disappointed that women started to be in the White House starting in 2021, 20, um, then um, you might want to have like a little private patriarchal remembrance thing um, when men used to be in charge. So this would be a mail order item from Amazon. You would get this tomb for patriarchy and the full piece is called Misogyny Mourns the Death of Patriarchy. So this is a diorama set that could be ordered by individuals at the time. And um, this is the misogyny figure here. Um, you might see that it looks like kind of a white male stockbroker. Um, whoops, don't want to lose the sarcophagus here. And I'm going to angle this a little bit. So you would set this up in your own dining room. And again, you could order it from Amazon. Yeah, you know, put misogyny a little bit closer. And then there would be a weeping willow background so that you could mourn the death of patriarchy. So I think um, for many sexists um, in the 21st century, um, they might get enjoyment out of this. 
Um, I found this, um, this was actually found at the Recology San Francisco waste site. Um, someone had finally realized they couldn't even show this in their house. So um, that's where this item came from and then it's been restored. Now I just want to tell you a little bit about this misogyny figure. Um, it's wearing a, what we call um, the MAGA red, M-A-G-A -A red color on the cloak, but it was also available in camouflage at the time. Okay, and then the last, oh yes, and I do have this picture here. This is what the diorama could look like also installed. So you have the full weeping willow and the, um, the figure. Now, um, some, as I mentioned, that that piece was found in the trash at Recology. Um, other pieces have been found in the trash as well. So um, this is a large sculpture that was actually unfinished. We believe it was commissioned by a, a fam famous movie producer in Los Angeles who subsequently went to jail. And so the commission was never finished. And we think that's why it was um, discarded here. Here's a close up of it. Um, if you're wondering what the text reads, it says, um, always on top. So that was a distinctly patriarchal monument here. Um, we also found this one at the dump. Now, can you see right here, hidden among the garbage, right, um, is a sculpture, and this piece is actually a mansplaining figurine. So I'm going to show you that once it got cleaned up, it looks like this. So um, this is a mansplaining piece, um, again, from around... 2018, 2019, when mansplaining was really on the uptick. And so um, the way we found this at the dump, buried in there, again, there were a lot of pigeons, which really speaks to how, you know, the birds feel about these patriarchal pieces. And so when we did display this after it was cleaned up, here I can give you a close-up so you can see the word mansplaining carved into the marble. Um, this was displayed at Recology in a recent exhibition to show what the disgraced monuments might have looked like. And we believe these all came from one person's collection that they had in their garden. Um, so we tried to recreate that garden when we installed it for display and of course we had to include the pigeons. So this would be like a little private garden with patriarchal monuments in it, um, someone that um, only you, you and your sexist friends might enjoy uh, behind your house. Okay, now if you want to see this monument in person, because it was discovered in one of the nine Bay Area, Bay Area counties, um, the mansplaining piece will be on display at the De Young Open. And so once we post this video, you can see the description in um, the uh, movie uh, with the link to the De Young Open. So the De Young Museum is in San Francisco. Um, it hasn't opened just yet, but when it does, there's going to be a very large salon style show. And I'm very happy to say that two of the patriarchal pieces that were found at Recology will be on display. Now I'd like to switch it up and talk about things that are cute. So let me uh, turn off the picture for a moment. And what I have here is a photo of Sydney, Australia. And I'm not sure if you can recognize this figure here. Uh, maybe some people know. This is a... Um, to, uh oh, now I'm like, uh, Twilight Sparkle. So this is one of the pretty ponies here um, that was built, and that's, of course, the Sydney Opera House here. So this thing is humongous, and um, this has an interesting story. You might think that pretty ponies are really directed at a young girl's audience, but in fact, this pretty pony was um, built thanks to fundraising by a collection of fans known as bronies. So there is a, um, a subgroup of fans for the My Little Pony series um, of men who enjoy this, and they actually have their own kind of conferences annually. Um, I think the largest ones, though, were really in like 2011, and so they um, joined forces. So they've managed to put little pretty pony statues um, in Sydney, Australia, San Paolo, Berlin, and also in Los Angeles. Now, the next piece I want to talk about is, of course, the Hello Kitty monument, which is another famous cute monument here. And so, um, you know, this is my little drawing, but as you know, it, it actually existed at one point in time and uh, it existed from 2007 to 2000, um, around 2011. Now, if you didn't get to visit Hello Kitty Monument, I, I'm sorry, it was, um, it was quite breathtaking. There was even an artist residency program there because the light was just right. So I can give you a little bit about the history and then some of the end controversy for Hello Kitty Monument. Um, so 
Hello Kitty Monument was um, created by a Turkish American um, cartoon artist named Tariq Felsik and he created it while he was working at Cartoon Network, but even in his off time, he made a mashup of Velma Dinkley and Hello Kitty and posted it to the internet at the time. So this is the final artwork here. And this artwork completely incensed true Hello Kitty fans. Um, part of the problem for Hello Kitty fans were, first of all, the glasses, which is, um, you know, a stereotypical, in you know, intelligence factor or um, having knowledge, whereas Hello Kitty is supposed to remain naive um, her whole life. There's also a mouth on the figure, and of course Hello Kitty doesn't have a mouth and always wants to be um, silent and let others speak for her. And then the last part of the um, this mashup that got trolled by Hello Kitty fans was the very slight indication of a female figure. There's just a little bit of line there. And of course Hello Kitty is supposed to always be in elementary school, like perpetually. So um, there are many things that the Hello Kitty fans hated about this. Um, Tariq Felsik was completely trolled on the internet and it made him completely distraught and he lost his position at Cartoon Network. Um, so in this period of... Uh, depression for Tariq. He decided to sign up for a tour, like a hiking tour in the Yukon Territory, and he went uh, by himself and actually like split from the group and went off by himself. And it was on this trip that he had the vision to create a monument devoted only to Hello Kitty to make up for his past mistakes. So, um, you know, no other figures joined in, just a monument to Hello Kitty. So this is actually the archived um, archived napkin drawing that Tariq Felsig made right after he had his vision. Um, you can see it like a dark stain on like, you know, to the, I guess, what is the right side of Hello Kitty's face. And that, um, we believe, is just like a coffee stain when Tariq had that. And um, you can see how it's supposed to be like 100 feet tall, a really massive one. So we believe he went out into the Uganda, kind of like looked around and said, like, this monument is where I want to be. And so then he started to build that illegally. So he went back home, picked up his mother, some engineering friends and a tour and started to um, and started to build the monument. Now, this is what it looked like at one of its heydays. If it's cut off for you, you might want to look at this um, in the full IGTV screen so you can see like all the way from top to bottom. The monument was, you know, exceptionally carved um, despite his, um, you know, uh, amateur skills. Um, he surrounded himself with good engineers and um, then um, the monument also became a point of visitors. So you can see from this picture here, um, there were even helicopter flights that you could take to fly around Hello Kitty Monument at the time. And um, celebrities, of course, visit. Now, it just seems like celebrities are always getting involved. Um, I've had to hide the identity of the celebrity um, so that uh, we don't get in trouble. But another celebrity I want to tell you about is um, was a troublemaker for Hello Kitty Monument. And that is this person right here. Elon Musk. That's right. Elon Musk is the reason for the destruction of Hello Kitty Monument. Um, the reason is Elon was interested in quantum data crystals. And quantum data crystals require um, one of the key elements that you can use is europium. And europium is found in certain kinds of granite. And I'm going to show you a close-up picture of a granite sample from Hello Kitty Monument here. And so um, this is it. This is what um, Elon Musk found so valuable. And so he bought it. So he bought Hello Kitty Monument. Like the, the monument was built illegally without the permission of the First Nations people that were there first. Um, and he negotiated directly with the Canadian government and managed to buy Hello Kitty Monument and subsequently um, built a wall around it and then mined it. So now Hello Kitty no longer exists. So that's one way when a celebrity got involved with a monument. Most unfortunate. There is another example of when a uh, celebrity got involved. Now here's an artist rendering of Hello Kitty um, Mountain Monument during sunset. And as I mentioned earlier, there was an artist in residence program there at the base of the mountain. Um, so this piece was um, done by an artist in resident. And, uh, but here's another proposal that was made. Remember, Hello Kitty Monument only existed between 2007 and 2011. Um, but it was during that time when 
um, Donald Trump was interested in having himself carved onto the monument. And so this is just an artist rendition of what that might have looked like. And so we managed, um, we uh, have a quote from him when he was on his way to Europe for a Miss Universe beauty contest. A reporter asked him if he was interested in being on the face of Hello Kitty Monument. And this is what he said um, from the um, daily Par Parisian paper, Les Fausses Nouvelles. Um, as long as my face is higher up and casts a shadow on hers, he would be okay with that. Now, Donald Trump maybe isn't the best um, addition to Hello Kitty Monument. Um, other people have been proposed, um, such as, oh, I can't find the picture. Do, do, do. Oh, I can't find it. Um, so, uh, Art directors such as Kathy Kimball of the ICA have also been um, suggested to be on Hello Kitty Monument, um, you know, honoring the fact that she supported the shows and also is just like way better than Donald Trump. So um, those are celebrities causing trouble. Now, I'm just about out of time before I turn to questions. And so I do want to show you something that is um, souvenirs from monuments. So a lot of people... Um, go and come back right now with digital photos. But as you know, um, in this um, COVID period, um, having human interaction or like a physical thing to remind you of something is quite rare indeed. And so I want to show you at Hello Kitty Monument. Let's see if I can turn the pictures off. I'm going to take one last look for that photo of Hello of Kathy Kimball on the monument. Maybe we'll post that later. Um, so this is a souvenir card from Hello Kitty Monument when it existed. Um, so this would be like a stamping card, and you had to buy the card, but the stamping station was free. And so it says, you know, I visited Hello Kitty Monument, proof of visit, and you write your name. And then this card could be mailed at the time. Now, of course, the USPS was completely destroyed around 2020, um, no longer exists. But at that point, um, stamps were still used um, between 2007 and 2011. And so I actually have, and I should... Put on my gloves, but okay, don't tell the art historian organization, but I'm not going to use a glove for this. This is actually one of the original stamps um, from Hello Kitty Monument here, and it has the logo of Hello Kitty Monument. So each year that it was open, um, the visitors could use a stamp and, and hit the card. So this one is from 2010. So I'm going to get out my stamp pad here and just show you what that looks like. Just a second here. Okay, so here's the Hello Kitty Monument stamp on the card, right? So it has the uh, the date, and then this was like a great souvenir that you could keep. Um, because we're still talking about celebrity interference, I did want to mention this one. Um, you may have heard um, as early as 2018 that um, someone else wanted to be on a monument um, that's famous. So I'm showing you this card. Um, this card was... Um, shared with the New York Times, um, leaked by a staffer of Trump at the time, when Trump was first thinking um, that he wanted to be on Hello Kitty Mon or, uh, Mount Rushmore. And so you can see from this, they've stolen the design from the Hello Kitty Monument souvenir card. You can see how similar these are. Here's like, you know, see the edges or the borders are the same. Um, and um, here it says Mount Trump more. Um, but you can also notice that Trump's head, now they had to bring in a lot of... Um, extra rock, and you're probably wondering where that rock came from. The answer is China. Apparently they have, quote, very, very good China, uh, rock in China, unquote. And Trump's head is a little bit higher than George Washington's, which is how um, Trump wanted that to be. Now, um, as my grand finale here, I'm going to put the souvenir stamp again. Now, this was just hypothetical. Donald Trump said, I want to be on Mount Rushmore. What would that be like? Let's start designing the merchandise already, which is, you know, how he thinks. Um, so with this uh, stamp, I'm going to stamp it up here. And again, this didn't happen, but this was pre-designed, and then the staffer leaked it to us. So I'm going to stamp the card, and you can see what um, the Donald Trump stamp. There it is. 
Okay, and so this ends up my talk uh, about monuments, so I'm ready to answer questions if you have them. So hopefully um, there'll be some questions coming through in the comments, if you can still hear me. Um, ask me anything you'd like. So let's see here. Any comments coming through? Now, I'll just start answering the kinds of questions I usually get um, while I wait. And um, so, some people ask about my hair. Um, they're, they feel like um, I look like what I study, which, of course, my area of specialty is, um, you know, the late 20th century, early 21st century pop culture. And yes, that's exactly right. Um, there are, um, because... Um, especially during the period known as the Tragic Kingdom, which was when Gwen Stefani ruled the pop empire. Um, so that was from um, 2009 to her death in 2061. Um, there was a style of hair called, you know, alternative. And so that's where I get this hair. So I really like to like invest myself completely in my re research. Um, a question has come up, are there other excavation sites from this period? And so by excavation sites from the period, I'm wondering if you mean right now. Um, one thing that's happening for sure right now is um, not just at Recology, but at dump sites throughout the nation, more and more patriarchal monuments um, are showing up in anticipation for the election. So we're expecting to find a lot more pieces like this one here on this marble piece that said unending patriarchy on it um, in the future. Now, again, this really isn't my area of specialty because I'm in invested in pop culture, but it is something that I was excited to um, discover. Okay, there was a question about, can you tell us about the bleaching and epilation exhibition? Um, that exhibition was called um, Once Plucked, Twice Shaved, and it um, took place at um, the Princeton University Gallery Annex in Ontario. So maybe you don't know that Princeton has a, an, an annex, um, and actually annexes throughout the, the, the um, upper North America. So um, the gallery exhibition showed um, pieces, for example, done that depict Brazilian waxing. Um, there's even an anal bleaching piece um, that's based on Rembrandt's anatomy lesson. Uh, and so there's um, a lot of documentation we have from art historical artworks, right, artworks of the time, um, depicting these events. Um, there was also some epilation and bleaching procedures that were drawings um, and um, lithographs meant for inclusion. I'm sorry, not lithographs, because lithographs didn't. Um, woodcuts meant for inclusion in Diderot's Encyclopédie, um, but they weren't connected with the publisher at the right time, and so there are no bleaching and waxing. Um, drawings in the encyclopedia, although we did display those original drawings from that period um, in the bleaching and waxing show. Uh, so there are some questions here. Are there any monuments you admire? And so I actually am... Uh, I'm working my way through um, a dossier of women sculptors, and uh, when I look at the works, um, a lot of them are done in a very traditional way, and again with this kind of hierarchy of like white males kind of controlling the look, but um, I found a, a collection of um, drawings of monuments that were never built by women and they have notes on them as well as like why this monument wasn't made or the committee said you know make the breast larger on this one or something and there might have been some kind of like argument back and forth between the artist and the people commissioning the monuments resulting in why they weren't built and so um, this dossier of unpublished um, uncreated monument drawings is something that I'm really connecting with at this point. Um, and as you could imagine, it's because um, the drawings span from, in this case, um, the early 20th century until the present, um, the archive shows different art historical styles as well. So for example, um, there is a burning bra sculpture that was proposed um, during the 70s um, that actually had kind of like a textile fabric feel to it. So I'm really connecting with um, the dossier of monuments that had you know, someday might be built. Okay, I'm looking for other questions here. What is on the scarf? A Hello Kitty stamp. Good eye. So, um, if you look carefully at my scarf, um, you can see um, 
that it actually has the logo from the Hello Kitty monument from 2010. So this is a vintage scarf. Well, I guess vintage has to be 25 years old. It's not quite that old yet, but this is actually one of the souvenirs that was sold at Hello Kitty monument, a um, scarf. And so this is the 2010 scarf. You can see here the logo in 2010 um, is a match. Yes, but thank you for noticing. Are there any other questions here? What is your favorite artifact in the collection? Um, one that I don't share very often. Well, that's a good one. Um, the bleaching and epilation pieces are very good. Um, well, I know there is a um, Chia Pet that um, we are very fortunate to have in the Museum of Historical Makeovers. I, I don't think I have a photo of it here, but um, it's a Chia Pet. So as you know, Gwen Stefani was always trying to reduce her carbon footprint um, while she was alive. And so it makes complete sense that in the afterlife, um, because she had an Egyptian style burial, because she, um, there's two reasons for this. So I'm sorry, let me back up. Gwen Stefani pharaoh of the pop empire, ruler of the pop empire during the period known as the tragic kingdom. So we did have an exhibition on Gwen Stefani's um, 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 mortuary temple at Swarm Gallery in 2009. The piece that we didn't show at that time is a chia pet so that, um, and this is, you know, left in the tomb so that Gwen could grow the sprouts in the afterlife. Um, but this one actually had a head sculpted to look like Gavin Rossdale. So Gavin Rossdale was uh, the first um, husband of Gwen Stefani and um, there was some kind of problem in their relationship and since that moment, um, as soon as they split, then um, Pharaoh Stefani had all records of Gavin Rossdale removed and it, everything was destroyed. So it's amazing that we found these like little shards that put together make a Chia Gavin Rossdale. Um, so that's one of the pieces. It's quite delicate because it was all broken in the trash and it was restored by experts, um, you know, um, in uh, England at the British Museum took a look at it and then we had specialists come in from the Netherlands um, to put together this Chia Gavin. And so now it's in the collection, but it's fragile, so we don't show it very often. Okay, let's see if I missed any questions. What is on your scarf? I hope I didn't miss any further up. Um, would it be easier for monuments to be built if, they're, if they didn't have a face on them, or were some built that had the heads removed so it was more pal palatable? I guess I'm not fully understanding the question. Um, I think that a lot of the women sculptors, um, particularly in the late 19th and early 20th century, those commissions were given to women primarily because the male sculptors were too busy. So, for example, um, some of the sculptures, um, sculptures made were um, basically cast-off jobs from the sculptor who created um, the uh, Lincoln Memorial. So uh, monuments were big at that time um, and there was just too much work and so generally um, women weren't selected to build monuments very often. Um, and even now there's controversy when a woman is selected to um, create a monument and uh, the Monument Commission, for example, might be canceled um, because the style desired still remains the traditional in the round figure. So um, it's kind of a difficult territory for women to navigate, but I am encouraged about the skill and um, passion to the art that I found in the dossier. Okay, so the, the question is, um, what year is it now? And so the year is 2040. And so that's how I can show you this chart. Right, of patriarchal monuments, right? After this period um, when women ruled, the, um, entered the White House and then continued to rule, then the patriarchal monuments um, disappeared over time. It's kind of a weird question to get. Everyone knows what year it is. Okay, are there any other questions? Well, I would like to suggest to you that you pick up my book. Um, I have a book on the Cult de Mignon, which is a society that we have evidence of um, as early as the time of the Sphinx, but also like definite um, evidence. Let's see if I have the picture here in my photo stream. Um, 
that uh, judge things based on cuteness. So this is called the cute, cute de mignon, and um, I wrote a book on that. So whether um, uh, you know you're interested in cute studies, um, you're thinking about um, taking class at the university, they're probably using my book right now. So I invite you to look up my name, Kathy Aoki, in cute de mignon, and you'll be able to find that easily on Amazon. Okay, I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, thank you so much for coming, and thank you again to the ICA for sponsoring this PSA Convo. Um, it is really my pleasure to discuss monuments, um, a topic that I'm very deeply involved with. If you have more questions, you can direct message me over Instagram or visit my website. And if you would like to see the patriarchal monuments that were discussed in this piece, um, at the De Young Open, I encourage you to check out their, their site. Um, there's artwork by, I think, around 780 Bay Area artists. And because those patriarchal monument pieces were found in one of the nine Bay Area counties, they were accepted to be on display. Okay, thank you so much. And if uh, you know people that missed this, um, you can encourage them to check out this. We'll post it probably later today. All right, take care, everyone.